All right. Hello there. We are live, I believe. <laughs> um, it's always helpful to let me know that you can see me and hear me. So if you're joining us live, please comment. Um, and I'd love to hear just who's participating too. It's super, um, super exciting for me to connect with students from all over the world. So please hop on, say hi. Um, I'm Carly Seifert. For those of you who don't know me um, and are coming to our Facebook page for the first time, I'm the creator of Busy Moms Do Piano and Busy Kids Do Piano. And I'm here today live to talk to parents specifically about motivating your student to practice. And this is a really big topic. Last month we talked about the importance of scheduling practice, why you should do that, and how you should do that. Oh, I've got Angela Winterlin Winterton joining us. Hi, Angela, nice to see you, glad you could join us. Um, and, oh, so I was saying, so last month we talked about the why of routine and how to get into that routine, and I feel like that's a really important first step to motivating your student to practice. So if you didn't get to join us for that one, please students look it up um, in the archive section of the video master classes, or you can look it up in the archive videos. That's really important, I feel like, for the first step in motivating your child to practice is just setting up, providing them with that structure in which to practice. But today I want to talk about more specifically like the motivation of practicing. And like I said, this is a really big topic, so I've done my best to kind of um, categorize it a little bit, and I'm going to just throw a lot of different examples at you from my parent, um, my experience as a parent, and my experience as a teacher as well. And I'd love for you to participate. So if you have things that have worked really well in your household, I would love to hear them and have you share them with everyone. Um, and it looks like we have Shanalee Adams. Hello from Texas. Welcome. Nice to have you both with us today. So please feel free to say hi, ask questions as we go. That's the cool part about being live. Um, so as I mentioned, we're talking about motivating students to practice, and I've kind of broken things down. These are going to sound like really scientific terms, but let me explain what I mean here. So the first thing I want to talk about is intrinsic rewards when it comes to practicing. And intrinsic rewards are the rewards that are directly related to the thing that we're doing, which is practicing piano. And these ones, if you have a younger student um, or, or really any age student, they aren't always quite as motivating. Um, but the goal that we want to get to, sort of the intrinsic reward that is the, the um, crowning glory, is to have a student that is practicing piano simply because they're wanting to learn how to play piano and they want to learn this piece and they want to learn how to play this specific piece. And I feel like that is why a lot of adults, why my adult students who sign up for Busy Moms do piano, it's why they enroll um, because they really want to learn to play the piano. But as kids, we may not always understand sort of the benefits of what we're doing, the why, the long term. Um, so, so understand that this is a good end goal, but we have to kind of motivate our students for a while to maybe get to that point. Um, so one of the ways the intrinsic rewards, so remember um, intrinsic, one of the ways sort of related to practicing piano, a way that I think is really motivating for students is providing them with opportunities to play in public. Um, I notice when I have my, um, when I teach at my home, my students that take from private lessons with me or group lessons with me, they're super motivated to learn a piece when they know they're gonna be playing it in front of their parents and their peers. So if we're there preparing for like a group class or if they're preparing for a recital and they know they're gonna have to play that piece, all of a sudden the practicing goes up a notch because <laughs> there's that sort of public element to it, right? They don't wanna feel embarrassed. Um, they wanna feel really proud. They wanna feel confident. And so if you're able to provide that opportunity for your student, I think that's great. For my online students, we do have some things in place where you can do that, um, like our online recital hall, which is inside the program, and our Facebook group. You notice if you scroll through there that our private Facebook group, we have a lot of people that share performances of themselves or their students playing. And so that's really fantastic as well. And then I think there's ways that we can also provide this, even if we're not in like a typical studio setting. Uh, if I have if students um, 
that have done talent shows or recitals at their schools. And so I would encourage you to look for opportunities like that. I have many students who are members of church and so they will be able to play a song for like pre-service before the service starts or offering um, something like that where they're able to to play in an element like that. And I would also encourage you to consider hosting a home recital for your student. I have several families that have done this and it's I, I hear such positive feedback from them. They have their kids design their piano programs and invite neighbors and relatives over and they put together a little program and play a few pieces that they've been working on um, for their neighbors and friends. And so that's, I think, highly motivating when you give your student a chance to share their accomplishment. And, and it's so beneficial outside of just the motivation of getting them to practice. It just helps them build their confidence too um, and their musicianship. Um, another way that um, we can sort of motivate kids to practice in a way that's directly related to them practicing is including their musical preferences and their musical tastes. So I had a student, um, this was a while ago, she's like off to college now, but when she was younger, she did not like to practice and um, very, very stubborn, gave her mom a lot of grief about it, but she loved the Beatles. And so I did a lot of digging and finally found this book of Beatle arrangements that were age appropriate or level appropriate for her. And um, that became how I motivated her to practice is she had to do all these other things, you know, her exercises and the pieces from her books. And, and if she did that, then we would add a Beatles song into the repertoire of what she was practicing. If she wasn't keeping up with that stuff, we wouldn't work on a Beatles song. Um, so we incorporated her own love, her own musical tastes for that. So if you have a kiddo who really likes um, Disney songs, getting a collection of Disney books, or we have some songs available within the popular repertoire bonus and for students that are inside my program. So you can watch um, those tutorials. We've got like songs um, from Moana and Frozen and Star Wars, and sometimes using those as rewards or as part of what your student is working on can be really motivating. Um, if you have a kid who really likes Broadway shows, I remember when I was a kid, Phantom of the Opera was my favorite. I know, maybe a little strange, but um, that was really motivating for me um, when my teacher bought me the Phantom of the Opera book and I began to learn music from that. Um, and I was motivated to become a better pianist too, because these were really advanced pieces. And so I had to learn to get to the level where I could play these pieces. Um, so show tunes, movies, bands, pop music, radio, all those things. If, if your student has a song they really love, you can incorporate that into their musical learning to be a motivating factor as well. And then I think um, adding social elements. Sometimes learning to play an instrument can be a little bit of an isolating experience because we're off on our own practicing um, no one really hears it. So, so making it social can help. And as I mentioned, doing those public performances is of course one piece of that. I think that makes it social. But um, if you have more than one child learning to play the piano, you, there's ways to make that sort of social where they can play for each other or they can play at the same time or they can learn a duet. Or if you have another student who plays violin, um, getting them to play together, just making it social, or a friend that plays. Um, or I have uh, students that um, have cousins that are really good at piano, and when their cousins visit them, they all gather around the piano and they share music, and they share what they're working on and their lessons, and that's really exciting for them. And so I know whenever my student has her cousin coming to visit, she kind of ups her game a little bit because she's going to be playing for her cousin, and she wants to show her cousin how good she is. Um, so making it social can be something that can be really powerful as well. So those are all intrinsic rewards. They're rewards that are related to the act of practicing the piano. I want to also talk about extrinsic rewards. And these are rewards that aren't related to practicing the piano, but I think that they have a place and I think they can be used in a way that is really um, practical and important as well. And um, there are some teachers who just really don't believe in these. They don't want to 
bribe their kids to practice. They call it bribing kids to practice. But I have found that students respond well to extrinsic rewards, my own kids do, and um, that when they're used well, they can be really effective. Um, and they don't need to be extravagant. This first one I'm going to talk about is just simple tokens of completion. So um, one of our homeschoolers, I know I've seen um, in the videos she sent, she has these great practice charts um, all up on clipboards on her wall. And at the end of each practice, their child gets to put a check mark on that. And so simply the act of completing that can be really motivating, especially if you have um, a student who's like a middle school or high schooler. Um, I know I get motivated by that, by making to-do lists and like being able to cross off the actual things that I have accomplished during the day. So um, something as simple as putting a check mark when the act is completed. Um, some students really love stickers. If they get a sticker on the piece when they've passed it off, or if you have, again, a chart printed out and you can put a sticker on it, that can be really motivating to earn that sticker. Um, candy, okay, I know this isn't for everyone. You can make it small. My um, son is highly motivated by candy. Um, and and he um, gets a jelly bean whenever he practices trombone, and that's, oh, Meg, Said, here, I'm going to post her comment. She said, not bribes, positive behavior reinforcement. That's a really good way to put it. And that is what I, I truly believe it is. And I've seen um, my one of my kiddos has therapy and um, he has jobs that he has to do in his occupational therapy. And when he completes the job, he gets a Skittle. And so that's how they motivate him to complete his jobs. Um, so positive behavior reinforcements, they can be very powerful for, for many things, including piano lessons. So like I said, you can keep them um, small or you might have it where they can um, earn a certain amount of check marks to earn some type of grand prize. And if you want to even take it back and make it something that's more related to what they're doing, for example, if you maybe it's the month of December and you want your child to practice for 14 days in the first couple weeks of December, or that would be a lot in the first three weeks of December. And then the reward could be if she earns that, you take her to see the Nutcracker. And um, and that's a really cool ex a musical experience related to what she's doing, too. So you could also have these practices kind of lead up to one grand reward or maybe they get a kite or just something that's a little bit bigger that's going to motivate them to earn a certain number of practicing. Um, immediate rewards. So what I am talking about with this is something that they earn right away when they practice. Um, and these I've noticed are really motivating for my daughter. She, especially in the summer when we're like home from school and there's not a lot of structure going on, um, she gets really, uh, she wants to play her Kindle. She'd like play her Kindle and Minecraft all day if I would let her. But what we do is that after she does her practicing, she earns 20 minutes of screen time. And so that's really motivating her to practice the piano so that she can have 20 minutes of Minecraft. Um, and maybe for your child, it's being able to watch TV or um, having a friend over or being able to play outside. Something like that can be really motivating and you can, again, build that into the routine. It kind of goes into last month's um, Facebook Live where we talked about building into your routine and allowing time for rewards. After that, this can be part of that routine that once you practice piano, you can go play with your friends. Um, and then finally, if you're a student inside my program, you will know that we do monthly practice challenges. And I try to vary these up so it's not always just like practicing a certain number of times each month. That is the February challenge. But there's sometimes where it'll be like completing a certain number of lessons or practicing a certain number of days in a row. Um, and, and then your name gets entered into a drawing and you will um, get a $10 gift card to Amazon. And the really cool thing, we've been doing these, I think we implemented them last June or July, I want to say. And it's been cool to, um, now I have like the data of who's completing these on a regular basement and I'm on, uh, who's completing the challenges on a regular basis. And I'm also able to see how far students are in the program. 
And of course, these students that are completing these challenges regularly, I have some that have completed every single monthly challenge, um, just to see their progress, that they're really pushing forward in the program. And, um, and when they share videos with me, I'm seeing them play much more difficult repertoire and just develop musically. So that's really exciting and obviously the goal, right? When we have kids practice, we want them to, to further their progress in their um, musical instruments. So I would encourage you, that's already built into the system, really simple to do, check into the monthly practice challenges and make sure that um, you utilize those if you think that's something that will be motivating to your student. And I have, um, let's see, kind of a summary of what we talked about that I'm just going to include in the comments here. So you can download basically show notes, kind of a summary of what we've talked about if you look at my link in the, the comments. And it's just going to be a summary of the intrinsic and extrinsic rewards and ideas. Um, so, because I know we watch these live casts, and then when you're sitting with your child on the piano bench, it could be easy to forget what we've gone over in more depth. So, I like creating these show notes just so you have um, something to to look at after the fact that you can implement. Um, so, those are there if you'd like to download those. I'd love to hear from you and hear um, first of all if you have any questions that have come up. Um, as we've been talking here, if you have anything that's been working really well for your family, I love hearing new ideas and I know that others would benefit as well from hearing um, maybe any kind of motivating factors or reward systems that you have in place in your homes. Um, so do feel free to share those. Um, I'm not seeing any pop up. But I'll, I'll hang out here for a minute and wait. I, I think I have a kiddo coming downstairs. Hi. My kids are on winter break right now. Um, so, so you may hear them in the background occasionally. They're not at school. Hi, Benjamin. Are you okay? Okay. Um, this is my Hello. son, Benjamin. Hello. Can you see yourself there? Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, Oh, Shannon had something to share. To go along with the social aspect, my son enjoys practicing if I'm sitting next to him and it becomes something we do together. However, this can backfire if I'm busy or stressed because it makes practice time a burden for both of us. The key is finding the best time for both of us. Yes, that is such a good point. I'm so glad you brought that up, Shannon, because I find the same thing with my daughter. Um, she just turned nine, and if I like leave her to her own devices to practice, there are tears of frustration she hates it. She will resist it. But if I'm there next to her, encouraging her and helping her break things down, like it's totally, it's totally fine. And, and we get through it. <laughs> Meg says, hi, sweet boy. Um, he came down for food. Now he's back upstairs. I banished them to the, uh, I, I let them play Kindle so that they would uh, be quiet. <laughs> but he came down for a food break. Um, yes, so I, I do totally agree with that Shannon and it's one of the reasons I encourage students to um, keep the pianos and maybe an area of the house that's got a little more foot traffic because sometimes if your child feels like they're banished into their bedroom to practice all alone they might resist that um, so I think participating in it um, I remember my mom when I was a more advanced student and didn't necessarily like need her there to kind of monitor my practicing she would just read a book in the room where I was practicing. Or if she was watching TV, she'd turn off the TV so that I didn't have that distraction. And I know she would enjoy listening to me play. So I do, do think that parental involvement can also add a social element. So thank you for, for bringing that up. I think that is really um, an important piece. And, um, and going along with that, next month's topic, I'm gonna be, I'm still kind of ironing out the pieces of it, but I want to do a series on raising an independent practicer. So we're going to talk about um, some strategies that your student can use to sort of self, what's the word I want to say, not self-regulate, but kind of figure out if they are playing a piece right. Um, and eventually get to that level where they are able to practice on their own. Here he is again. Hi, do you just like looking at yourself? Hey guys, can I bring some kale corn upstairs? Go ahead. I can't reach it. Um, can you take a chair over? 
came down from our food. <laughs> um, real life. This is what happens when you're like, what? Don't stand on the bar stool. You can bring that chair over. Okay. Um, I forget what I was saying now, but yeah, but we're going to be talking about some more strategies uh, your child can implement so that they're able to eventually practice independently um, with more uh, super or with less sort of supervision and able to practice really effectively. Um, so we'll be doing a series on that. I just have to figure out how I'm going to break it down, but we'll start that in March. Um, so I've been getting some questions around that, like how does my child know if he's playing it right? And so um, we'll be talking about that a little bit more. So I'm not seeing any more questions or comments popping up. Hopefully that means that we just covered everything so thoroughly and in depth that that you don't have any questions, right? Um, oh, good. Uh, Shannon says, I love that. I have wondered how to make my kids have more practice, independent practices. Yes, we're kind of, I'm kind of in that in-between stage with my daughter right now where she's nine. And like, I think she probably depends on me a little too much for practicing. And so I'm trying to um, practice what I preach basically. Um, so it's it's been a good uh, self-reflection time for me and uh, something that I thought would be helpful for, for other parents as well. Um, so, all right. I'm not seeing any other questions pop up, but I sure appreciate all of you for joining me live and saying hi and contributing and um, I, I will just say that I think that so much of the success for students in piano, and my when I say success, I don't mean like your child becomes the next Beethoven. I just mean that your child can play piano proficiently and enjoys playing piano. That's what I mean when I talk about success. I think that that really depends on Hello. parental. Hello. That's my microphone, buddy. Parental involvement. Um, and if you're part of the process. So that's why I do these master classes, because I think that it, it really um, is something cool that we can do to get parents more involved in the process. Okay. You enjoy seeing your hand up there? All right. I'm well, up. hi. Hi. Okay. I bought cookie butter up there. Yay. Whoa, you sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I think I will wrap up. Let's see, see any more antics from my crazy five year old here. Um, so, thank you so much for joining us. I'll see you next month. I hope you have a fantastic week. If you are watching this later and you have any questions, please feel free to share them in the comments and I will respond. All right, take care and bye for now. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi. Ella, why did you leave? I'm trying to sign off and it's not letting me. All right, let's see. I know it's not letting me log off. I keep clicking end broadcast and I can see that I'm still live here. So I'm sorry, guys.